All right, I guess we can get started. Uh, so welcome to the 590 seminar. Yeah, my pleasure to introduce the speaker this week, Dr. Kathleen Am. Um, she, well, on a personal level, we used to work together in our younger days, back at the GE Research Center. This was a relatively small group. Yep. Maybe about 20 people. Yep. But they did some really big things. They launched the, the billion dollar MRI magnet business for GE. They worked on uh, superconducting machines, big DOE, Air Force. <coughs> so we got to learn from some true giants in the field. Um, but I came over here and she went to bigger and better things. So she's now division head at the Brookhaven National Lab. Um, she got a PhD in condensed, condensed matter physics from the Florida State University and a BSc in math and physics at the University of Toronto. She has over 25 years of experience in superconductivity and magnet design. Uh, her primary research areas include MRI and medical application of superconductivity, superconducting electric machines, that's what brings us together, high temperature superconductivity, and material properties at low temperatures. Kathleen is, um, um, like I said, division head at BNL. Uh, she um, participates in several professional societies, a senior member of IEEE, member of CSA, which is the uh, Council on Superconducting Applications, and ASME. She's a board member of Applied Superconductivity Conference and Superconductor Science and Technology. Uh, she's also a DFSS black belt, a uh, certified black belt, and a matriz, and mat matriz? Matriz, so matriz, matriz. yeah. Certified. Yep. So welcome, uh, look forward to your talk. Great, well thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today, and you know, please do feel free to ask me any questions, and I was gonna say if anyone wants to get together, I unfortunately have to take a phone call back to BNL right after this seminar, but I would be very happy to talk to any of you at five o'clock, I'll be parked in, um, Dr. Haran's uh, office, or Professor Haran, sorry, I should say professor. Dr. Yes. Well, a little bit. I mean, I was here for, I was at the U of I for, for six, or not quite, for, yeah, for six months before um, going down to the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory um, to finish my PhD off down there because my advisor moved down there. Um, but uh, a very, this is a great institution, um, and it just was fabulous to get a tour of the labs here today. And you should all be very proud to have been accepted here and to be doing your um, degrees here. It's a, it's a great institute, and many great Just people have come out of here. Yes, I know. I know. She was telling me all about it when she came to talk at the, uh, the Applied Superconductivity Conference a while back. So, so today I'm going to talk to you about my new place. That I'm, I'm pretty new to Brookhaven. I've been there about a year, so I'm still learning everything that we do. But I will tell you about some of the things that I've learned about what I like to call the best kept secret at the best kept secret because Brookhaven has not done a fa fabulous job sort of getting the word out on all the great stuff they're doing and our la the magnet group there has been kind of also very hidden in the accelerator world. So I just want to sort of give you a little bit of an overview. Let's see if this, there we go. First an overview of it, what, it, what exactly accelerators are because I know that not everybody may know what a particle accelerator is. And then talk to you a little bit, a little bit about the group I'm running and the mission and vision and some of the history of that team and current projects that we're working on. And then talk a little bit about the future opportunities that we're developing in the group. And then um, you know, we'll conclude and we can, we can have a further discussion on things as well. So BNL is one of the DOE labs, right? That's correct. So DOE is one of, I think it's like 15 different uh, national laboratories run by um, the Department of Energy. And BNL um, is very fortunate to actually have two, two facilities. One you see here, which is the, um, this, this thing here, which is called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. This is the only superconducting accelerator in the United States of America today. Um, and so it, we're very proud to have this. It's been operating since the, the late 90s. It's 3.8 um, uh, kilometers in terms of circular tunnel, so they have a nice um, 4K around the ring every, or 3.8K, I guess in this case, around the ring every year as well. Um, and uh, it's, we're very honored to have this. And I'm going to talk some more about the next project that we're hoping will be uh, housed in this in this ring as part of my uh, my talk, which is going to be called the Electron Ion Collider. And that's that's going to be a very important project for Brookhaven. We also have what's called a, a light source, which is where electrons are accelerated around a ring and make x-rays that are used for many, many different studies of materials. 
um, and, and other materials. And we have a number of accelerator, smaller accelerator facilities that you see here um, that are used for various various applications as well. So um, the superconducting is this mag. The, um, is this the uh, performance limit is uh, where you need a clearance to work? So, so for this, for the RIC, um, no, you don't need clearance to work in RIC, but there are facilities that do do things that require clearances. So when you come to Brookhaven as a visitor, you need to um, go through a gate with guards and, and make sure, you know, you have to go through a process to apply to enter Brookhaven as a guest just to make sure, you know, that you're not going to any of the, the, the clearance areas unless you have the proper clearance. So we do have people that do have secret clearance, for example, working on projects at Brookhaven. Uh, there's some nuclear nonproliferation stuff where that mainly happens, although some of the accelerator work also falls into that space and some of the detector work, because we have a very strong instrumentation team that works on detector work that they do some stuff for NSA and such in terms of detecting nuclear materials. So these, uh, these beautiful magnets that you see here were constructed by the group that I, I currently am responsible for at Brookhaven. These, these magnets um, have an incredible, incredible history. The team at Brookhaven, there were many accelerator magnet projects that, that failed. There was one called Isabel, which was what they originally dug that tunnel for, and the magnets failed for that, so they canceled the project. Then the superconducting super collider came around in the U.S. and the bro group at Brookhaven, along with Fermilab and others, and Lawrence Berkeley, worked on magnets for that. And those, again, were going to be too expensive. And so they canceled the project there. Well, the third time was the charm of Brookhaven, and that's when these magnets were built. So they learned a lot from their experience of working on these two other projects where superconducting magnets failed to meet the requirements, were too expensive. And these magnets were very affordable. They also made, the, made these magnets and transferred them to industry seamlessly, which is one of the biggest superconducting projects that's actually been transferred to industry that I'm aware of before the Large Hadron Collider. So the Large Hadron Collider, which I'll talk about in a minute, is at CERN. And this is an even larger tunnel, so this is 27 kilometers. And this is the, um, the world's current high en highest energy um, particle accelerator used for high energy physics today. Right now, um, it's going through a series of upgrades. It's in its current, it's uh, planned shutdown two right now, and they're getting ready to install some 11 Tesla dipoles during this period, which is pretty exciting. And then there'll be another shutdown in several years where magnets that my team is working on are going to be installed into the tunnel. Um, so this, this CERN, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, was based on the technology that came out of the RIC, the RIC experience, because those magnets worked seamlessly. They did not, um, um, uh, did not quench. They performed well. And so CERN then took that technology forward into what are the superconducting magnets that you see here inside the CERN tunnel. So in RIC, there were two, you saw there were two sets of magnets. Here, they've combined uh, to make this, this more compact and, and higher energy. They put the, the magnets, two magnets together into the cold mass here. And so this, this design came out of the Brookhaven design to successfully do this. And actually, Brookhaven was a key partner with CERN. Many people came over from CERN in the early 90s to work with the Brookhaven team to learn about their magnet technology and then incorporate that into the design for the Large Hadron Collider. And so this just sort of gives you a very brief summary of some major accelerator projects that have taken, have taken place over the last, so since the 1970s. So the first, of course, was at Fermilab, the Tevatron, which was the, the very first um, superconducting um, accelerator developed uh, just, just up to the north of you at Fermilab. Uh, this was a huge accomplishment, the Tevatron. It actually led to the development of commercialized superconductors that also helped the, the um, early MRI industry take off and, and do very well. It would have taken a lot longer to develop MRI if the Tevatron had not commercialized and made commercial niobium titanium conductor out of it. And then there was another um, accelerator that came after that called the HERA. Um, accelerator that was commissioned in, uh, in 1990. And unfortunately, the SSC uh, was canceled in 1993 um, because, as I said, the magnets were quenching too much. Uh, they were quenches. Let me just explain a little bit what quench is. So quench is a behavior that super, so superconducting magnets carry uh, current without any resistance. But if they get above um, a certain temperature or a certain field level, they'll become normal. So they go through a phase change, basically. And when that happens, these magnet, the, the, the conductors become very, very resistive very, very quickly. So in the early days of superconductivity, th this was something they learned very quickly because they made wires out of the material and they burnt out 
all over the place. So then they figured out, well, we have to put stabilizer on it. So they started putting copper around the superconductor to help carry the current and balance it out when, uh, when you would get small perturbations. The problem with the SS, oops, let me go back. The problem with the SSC was that these magnets did what they call their training curve. Training is like where you take a magnet and you, it, it'll go up, it'll quench. It'll go up, it'll quench. It'll keep going up and up and up in current level until it reaches the design point, hopefully. Now, if a magnet is well behaved, this doesn't take very long and you just have a couple of these quenches. If a magnet is poorly behaved, it can take a lot of these quenches to get to the designed, the designed field strength and design currents. Um, the SSC magnets took like about 100 of these training quenches. So when the program manager at DOE saw that, she, um, according to Bruce Strauss, who was there at the time and was on the phone with her, said a bunch of words that I won't say in front of an audience. And well, that was the beginning of the cancellation of this program. So you really need to have magnets that are going to perform properly. Um, there was another um, accelerator, the UNK, in Russia that also got suspended um, around the same time. And then Rick, of course, was a big success, thank goodness, because otherwise there might not have been any more high energy physics um, accelerators. And then out of that, then the LHC came and was commissioned in 2008 and discovered the Higgs boson, which was a big, big physics breakthrough. So now they're trying to figure out what are the next steps. So as I mentioned to you, these superconductors have, you know, they have a critical transition at a certain temperature. Um, and so the, 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 the good news is that they can carry no current. The bad news is you have to think about how, to, oops, this thing is going crazy, how they, uh, how they behave. And so why, why do we want to use superconductors and electromagnets? Because these things are typically, uh, typically work at very, very low temperatures. So the low temperature superconductors um, work around 4.2 Kelvin. They go a little bit higher than that, but liquid helium is kind of the working fluid that we keep them cold with. Um, high temperature superconductors can work up to liquid nitrogen temperature, although they're used over a, a range of cryogens, some at hydrogen, some um, in neon, some in, in liquid helium, depending on what the application space is for the superconductor um, and how high a field is. So the reason that accelerator magnets, the only reason that you would go to these, these very exotic and high field magnets is really to reduce the size of the tunnel. Because if you think about when I'm accelerating a particle in a magnetic field, you know, it's, it's proportional to the field strength or I have to have a gigantic ring. And so the combination is you're getting to higher and higher powered accelerators. You need to have higher field strength to, to reduce the size of the ring. And so that, that um, right now, um, going, going to the next level beyond the LHC, they're looking at um, field strengths of 16 to 20 Tesla. Um, which sort of translates to a current density of greater than 500 amps per millimeter squared. So these are very, very substantial um, current densities. And that really is, is causing a lot of challenges. And a lot of one of the big problems that we have right now is this FCC, the, the, the proposed high energy colliders. Um, you know, when we look at the future circular collider at CERN, these are, these are um, you know, going to really need some very, very high energy and large tunnels. So not only do I have to dig a much bigger tunnel, I have to look at very, very high energies and high fields. The conductors that are available for this are niobium-310 and high temperature superconductors. And the problem with these materials is the niobium-310 is very, very expensive to fabricate uh, because it's a very brittle material. And so I have to, what I have to do with these conductors is actually make a coil and then, uh, so I wind it, then I have to react it in a big furnace. And I'll show you some of those facilities that from Brookhaven today. With uh, high temperature superconductors, these are in tape form. So I have to figure out, and they're, very, they're already very expensive to begin with. Then I have to figure out how do I make a cable out of these high temperature superconductors um, to, to do things. And then it's interesting, the Chinese right now are also looking at building um, a, a big uh, uh, collider as well in the space. And they're really focused on more the electron um, electron collider, so to make a bunch of Higgs particles basically in here and do what they call a Higgs factory. They're actually looking at iron pyctonides, which are a new superconductor that they think they can make at a much lower cost. So they have a big de conductor development to, to look at this, so we'll have to see where that, that goes um, as well. Oh, that's just another picture of the FCC. Let me skip that. So uh, as I was mentioning, in the, um, the mechanical and the magnetic structure of these magnets, so these are iron laminates around the outside. Here in the center, you'll see the superconducting coils. So these are um, effectively, this, is, this type of design is called a cosine theta design. 
because the, um, the, the dipole conductors that you see here are sort of arranged in what, would, what physicists would call the most efficient structure for building, <clears throat> building a magnet. Now, when you talk to the mechanical engineers, this is not the, the best structure, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. But they designed the, the, oops, the LHC to be um, a side-by-side -side, um, uh, thing to reduce the, the size of the cryostat and be able to fit in the, uh, what was the LEP tunnel before it became the LHC. So this, was, this is probably the pinnacle of niobium titanium um, magnet technology in the LHC. And you can see that they, you know, these are, they, they, these are very large magnets weighing 50, 35 tons. They're 14.3 meters long, and they carry 11.8 kiloamps. So these are really, really big magnets. The cables in these are um, basically Rutherford cables of superconductors. So they're, they're twisted around to reduce AC losses as you're ramping these things up and down. This is another picture of um, one of the LHC dipoles. And here's a cutaway sort of showing the cryogenic structure. So here are the coils inside of um, a helium vessel. Through the middle of the coils, that's where the beams go, right down the middle. And those are vacuum, vacuum tubes where the beam is going from quadrupole to, or sorry, quadrupole to quadrupole or dipole to dipole. Um, I should just briefly explain in accelerator magnets, the dipoles accelerate the beam and the quadrupoles focus the beam back together because as you're going around in a circle, the beams will spread with, within a dipole when you think about spread in the distribution of the beams, so the quadrupoles refocus them. And then when you get to the interaction region where the beams collide into each other, you have a bunch of multipole magnets to really focus them down and bang them right into each other so that you can get lots of interactions. <clears throat> are all these designs that you're showing, are they all <clears throat> leak in front of the <clears throat> implementation of the system the world? They, they tend to be unique, that they, they, they look at it, what the technology at the time can handle and design the, the, uh, the most aggressive magnet design at that point in time to be able to, to do so. Yes, they are all unique, I would say. But there are sort of some similar things like that cosine theta design has been very commonly used in, in several accelerator magnets. And, and that was due to the fact that it uses the smallest quantity of conductor. However, the ends which I'll get to here. So if you look at, with the challenge that you have here, these cosine theta magnets, they're really beautiful when you look at a nice cross section of it. But when you get to the ends, these are really ugly. Um, these see high forces, high, you know, high, and this is typically like one of the areas where these magnets will, will quench. This is where they train the most. This is where we have the most mechanical problems. These are the limitations that we'll see um, in, in the conductors. So one of the things that, you know, we're thinking about for future colliders is really what is the geometry that we need. And in my humble opinion, and I can say this because I'm a physicist, I really think we need to think about what the mechanical engineers and the electrical engineers need to do with a viable coil design and stop letting the physicists design the magnets. Because I, if I was, if I was designing this magnet, I never would have designed it this way. It's crazy. Um, and so one of the things, actually, a very smart physicist in my group, actually, I'll just skip this and come back to this, because um, I, whoops, I want to show, where is it? come back to it. I'll talk to you guys about that later. But there's a really interesting, oops, let me go back. I thought I had a picture of it, but I don't. Um, anyway, what I'll talk to you guys about later is some s possible solutions that are much simpler um, to this type of design, going back to just doing a regular, a regular coil rather than doing these saddle coils. So just think about, it'll be a, a, a coil where I have just two simple dipoles. And I'll show you how you can do a, a two-beam magnet with that which is very interesting. So that's one thing that one of my physicists actually came up with, but I think is a very practical engineering design. So just to talk a little bit now about my, my group, um, what, over the past year, I've really been working with my team to think about where do we want to go in the future. We're an accelerator magnet group at the core, but where do we want to go? How do we really want to have an impact on the world of superconducting magnets, both in the US and around the globe? Um, and so really, this group has been at the lead of superconducting magnet technology for many, many years. We've worked on many of these accelerator, big accelerator magnet programs. Um, so we want to maintain that and grow that. And really, we're focusing across the board, and we have the capability to look at everything in the superconducting magnet design from the initial paper studies, the initial science and R&D of magnets, all the way through to developing complete um, magnet designs building the coils, building the mechanical structure, and then testing it in our advanced test facility. And so the main application areas that we're working on is really in the accelerator spaces, again, at our core. 
but we also can develop we and have developed magnets for science we're really getting into the fusion space there's a very interesting thing happening in in compact fusion right now there are a number of companies around the globe that are looking at making very compact fusion machines with very very high current conductors with hts conductors and so commonwealth fusion in boston has just started working with us um, on this and we just had a big announcement of a grant that we're working on together and then the other thing and part of the reason they brought me in from ge to run this team was really to look at industrial applications of superconductors you know it's been super the high temperature superconductors when they were discovered this was a really big thing that they thought hey maybe we can really have some really interesting applications you know we had the superconducting car and superconducting transmission lines and all this kind of thing and we found there are, the problems were much harder to solve than we thought but things have developed a lot more things have been carried carried forward cryogenics has become a lot simpler since then and so this is an area that i think we're just at the beginning of and there's a lot of opportunity um, for us to you know for us to look at it and, and part of my goal and part of what doe is really looking at is how do we partner with universities with industry to really take technology forward and bring the technology into the industrial sector and help um, the united states in terms of um, new technology development and we're actually being measured on that now so it's it's a pretty exciting time and then we have some really great facilities i'm going to quickly walk you through as part of this talk and who are the competitors, <clears throat> who are the competitors within the national lab complex or uh, well, I'll ask you both <clears throat> nationally and also internationally so <clears throat> i would say the way i'm, I'm looking at things is yeah there, you could talk about competitors amongst the national labs but the way i'm looking at it is what is my competitive advantage versus you know a berkeley lawrence berkeley labs fermi lab the national high magnetic field laboratory in my group the other way i look at it is how do we all successfully work together to help the the ecosystem move forward because the reality is in the magnet world today and this is why i say this part this is a very very important part of our mission right now because this field is so small there are so few people in it that I don't think we can lose a single one right now. We need to really make sure that we have a strong national talent pool, which, we, which does not exist today in superconducting magnets, if this technology is going to continue forward into the future. The majority of them are retiring. Many of our, of our sort of grandfathers of this field who started in the 60s and 70s are passing away. It's very sad. We, you know, my generation that came in with the high temperature superconductors um, were, were the last bubble. And so there's very few after me. So I come and I talk to students trying to encourage them that this is a really exciting field, that this is where we're going. So I kind of think of it as, yes, you know, I could think of Fermilab as being our biggest competitor, but I could also say I need all those, those magnet engineers and scientists there, you know, because I don't look at it as competing for funding. Even if we do, the way I look at it is how do we all work together to make things happen? And how do I make my Brookhaven team the right size, the right composition to do the things that need to get done? I think, <clears throat> The Chinese, I think, are really, really an interesting problem right now, I would say. They, they are working very hard to develop, and they will develop an accelerator, I think, with or without the rest of the world. So that is a big concern right now, um, you know, in terms of what that means in terms of, uh, you know, the future of things in the U.S., not just in the accelerator space, but beyond that as well, in intellectual property. So that's, that's a big one. The and Russians, the sorry. <clears throat> It's growing again. In the last four years, it's been growing. Uh, before that, it was going down, but it has been growing at DOE in this space in the last uh, the last couple of years. The other thing I would say is the Russians have an incredibly strong program in superconductivity as well. And actually, many of the, the superconducting wiggler magnets that are used in, in accelerators around the world were developed in Russia. But now, with our trade policies, it's very difficult to buy them from Russia. So the Russians also have a very strong program as well in superconductivity. <clears throat> So moving on. Well, oh, there still are a lot there. They even have a company named Tavel that makes superconductors as well and sells them around the globe. So as I mentioned before, I talked to you guys about the relativistic heavy ion collider, which is a real jewel that the team worked on. From there, they went on to work on accelerator magnets for the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. They did a great job and actually won um, an award from the head of DOE for their excellence in, in executing this project. Um, so this, this uh, is our what we call our direct wind machine, and I'll show you a little bit, a movie of that in a second. This is actually niobium-titanium conductor that is being put down with an ultrasonic head and epoxies 
on this, this drum. And this technology was developed at Brookhaven and is used around the world in those uh, magnets that I told you about in the interaction region. So these, these magnets are in, in, in the KEK accelerator in Japan, in the RIC collider. They're also in the LHC and um, other, you know, other experiments that are being done at CERN as well. So this is a, this is a very nice uh, oops, technology that we have. Um, <clears throat> this also is, uh, so we have quite an active program in HTS superconductors. These are two projects that we've worked on in the past. This was a high temperature superconducting magnet for the, uh, the FRIB, the facility for rare isotope beams in Michigan State. This was a prototype that was developed for that and tested successfully. Um, it was not actually implemented in the machine because of cost reasons. So again, like I said, those HTS conductors are still, still too expensive, so they went with niobium titanium in the, in the machine, but it was successfully tested. And then this is a, 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 a SMAS, a superconducting magnetic energy storage device that was built with HTS solenoids um, and tested. This was done in partnership with Superpower um, several years ago. And this actually, um, actually I'll, I'll take you through some of the field strengths on that. Um, so who are we? We have a group of about 33 scientists, engineers, and phenomenal technicians, some of the best I've ever worked with. Um, and again, as I said, we can, we can do everything from design through to constructing magnets. We have coil winding facilities. Um, we are able to build a whole magnet, and we have multiple magnet test facilities. We have five test stands that are available. Um, some of the current projects we're working on, there is the EIC project that we are competing with JLab for. And that has these, uh, these direct twine coils, our unique technology to help us really focus the beams. The electron ion collider is basically a, a, a collider where we're going to be banging electrons into uh, nuclei. And that's going to tell us a lot about the whole structure of the nucleus and also how the quarks and gluons work together inside the nucleus. So the way that people talk about it, they talk about it as like a microscope for the nucleus is sort of how to think about it and all the physics that's going on in there. So, so that's, uh, that's a very exciting project for us. The, right now, we're in the phase where the government is deciding that it's going to be a project. There's a lot of activity going on in Washington around this. And we're very hopeful that this will be decided in the course of the next year as to whether it goes to, to Jefferson National Labs or to Brookhaven. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. We're doing a lot of preliminary research. Um, we even work in partnership with JLab on some of the things. And I think the thing that's really nice is the magnet groups at Brookhaven and JLab have actually worked together on several things. And I know personally some of the people that, that were there, as does Karuba. So there's a lot of, a lot of good synergies uh, as well there. Um, another very important program that we just have entered, even though it's been going on for a couple of years at Brookhaven, is the Magnet Development Program. This is a program, an R&D program, to work on superconducting magnet technology for future accelerators. So for that future circular collider or whatever machine gets built. So this, this, is to, this, this test stand that I show here, I'll talk a little, in a little bit more detail about, is very nice for testing cables and superconductors um, for those potential uh, future uh, future magnets. And then the big project that we're working on right now is the upgrade for the large um, Hadron Collider. And this is a picture of the test stand and some of the engineers and technicians who are working on the testing of this, uh, these big magnets. And they're, they're quite impressive. These magnets are 4.6 meters long. So you can kind of see with the scale of the people. These are, these are big magnets. They carry um, up to uh, 16 kiloamps in current. So these are, these are very substantial conductors. And that just shows you here. And maybe I'll go to the next chart because I think you can see it better here. If I can get it to work. There we go. So this is our direct wind machine. And you can see the ultrasonic head here um, working on the epoxy on the conductor to lay it down. And we can wind very, very complex shapes with this machine, many different kinds of multipoles. Um, and we do it, we can just basically transfer the, the, you know, the path length that you would be looking at on this. And this, this has been very, very helpful for um, niobium titanium magnets. We have, you know, for niobium 310, we can't really do this because you have to uh, wind and 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 uh, and then react it, or the bending have a very tight bending radius for this type of technology. And so, it's really for flexible conductors, but it's uh, it's worked very nicely for that. So, <clears throat> to give you an idea of the different capabilities we have, I talked about the direct wind. We have a very large 4.2 meter. Um, uh, furnace to be able to react the coils for those long magnets that I was talking to you about for the um, accelerator uh, upgrade project. And then we have these very long winding machines 
Um, in addition to, we also have a multi-axis machine that's not shown in this picture, but these are able to wind very long coils. Um, we can go up to 10 meters long in this. So there's a lot of good winding capability here. And we do it for superconducting coils, but we certainly could do it for conventional coils as well if there was this interest. And then we have this vertical test stand that can go to, uh, like we test at 1.9 Kelvin because these, these magnets have to operate it as, at the highest possible field. So we, cool, we subcool to 1.9 Kelvin. We can also test at 4.2 Kelvin, of course. And these are, we have power supplies that go up to 22 kiloamps. It's a six point meter deep uh, facility, so we can test very long magnets in this facility. And um, I would also say that we have other power supplies that we are using to up this current as well. So if you do, we did want to go to higher current densities, we're looking at how we can up this. Right now, we could, we, we're, we're putting two, um, two uh, power supplies in, in addition to this to get to 35 kiloamps. And we're hoping in the future that we'll be able to get an investment to go to 50, because that's really what the fusion community is looking for. Just checking my time. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have we we were working in the R and D phase for these uh, niobium three tin magnets, and that now has really turned into a full project. So we're out of the R and D phase. We're now into the project. Now this is a what what I would call a training curve for the magnet. So each of these dots represent a current that the magnet got to, and then um, and then quenched. And so you can see that each time, you want these lines to go up <clears throat> until you get to the, uh, this is, the, the, there's, there's sort of an uh, operating, the operating line for the, um, the high Lumi upgrade is here, but they have this thing called ultimate that they'd like to eventually get to if they could, but there's a lot of ifs and ends and buts about it. But as you can see, these magnets take a long time to train and some of them even what we call detrain when they go back down like this. So this technology we're still working on to see how, how can we really get this this to work at the highest level. So we may end up just operating what they call nominal rather than going all the way up here. And that's the jury's still out on that. There's still a lot of debate. We just had a workshop last week with the folks at CERN to talk through some of that. And the magnet structure that we, we use for these high Lumi upgrade quarter poles. So these are quarter pole, quarter pole magnets. So you can see here we have conductors here. So these are each, each a saddle coil or set of saddle coils here, here, here and here. So we have four coils assembled into this magnet. There's a support structure that gets put around it. This is called a bladder and key structure. So what you do is you have um, you have uh, magnetic steel around this because this is both structural and support structure for it. Um, and then in each of these, this is a design that was that came out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Um, we call it bladder and key because each of these compress each of these pieces here compress the magnet. And so the bladders are basically stainless steel pieces that are welded together and then they put the water into them to expand this. And then they slide a key into the middle here, 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 and here to hold this whole structure together and, um, and, and clamp it into here. And then this is aluminum on the outside that then compresses the steel all together so that the magnet, this, this, this type of structure is used with niobium three tin magnets because they, they, they basically um, can control the, the stress concentration very well um, because these, these materials are very brittle. So you have to make sure you're not putting too much force on it or you'll damage the conductor. And there were a lot of experiments carried out in this, um, <clears throat> the, the large accelerator um, research program. Um, this, uh, this, this program carried out a lot of work to see what the, what the right pre-stresses were on these to, to ensure that they'd work. Um, once they get compressed down at 4.2 Kelvin or 1.9 Kelvin. So it was quite the, quite the engineering feat. A lot of mechanical engineering analysis went into this. Then as I was mentioning before, as I said, these structures and these magnets have very complex geometries. They have tight bending radii here. And the Lorentz forces that you see on these ends cause that training that you saw on the last chart, which is, which is not, uh, not very de well desired. So what my, my colleague Ramesh Gupta came up with um, in the early, actually late 90s, early 2000s, he started working on this um, idea of what we call common coil. So these are, these are simple racetrack coils, coil one going one direction and coil two going the other direction. And you can think about putting beams down one because I have a dipole here and I have a dipole here. So this is a very nice, you know, nice engineered structure where my ends can be well mechanically supported and he actually demonstrated this and built a magnet 
um, at Brookhaven that demonstrated this, uh, this technology. And what we've been struggling with is getting the physicists to believe that this will work which I think it will. And there, you know, we already are doing massive corrections anyway for the ends with the, with the bent part. But this is, it's very interesting to me, the whole interaction that happens sometimes between scientists and engineers on these types of things. So anyway, this is something that's still a proposal. And actually, one of the uh, designs that CERN is looking at for the FCC is this type of design. So it is still under consideration besides the cosine theta, because you may have to go to this to be able to support the large forces you're going to see on the ends at 16 and 20 Tesla. So as I said, um, Ramesh built one of these coils, and it's a very nice, actually, test facility that we have. So that test facility I was mentioning for the magnet development program is this, uh, this magnet here. So there's actually a space that's very nice for putting coils and test samples and, oops, go back, and test samples and things into in this magnet. So, in this space, you can put a coil or a conductor of some type and slide it in. So here's a cartoon of the, the coil in the middle. And we can test these magnets either in series. So we can do a hybrid magnet, which he's done with HTS uh, conductors in here. Um, or you can do them, you know, you can just put a, a coil in there and operate it separately from the main niobium, um, niobium titanium coil. We also have um, some very sophisticated quench protection uh, systems that we use both for the HTS coil tests that we have and also for <clears throat> our large magnet tests. So um, our engineering uh, leader, uh, Piyush Joshi, has developed some very nice uh, quench protection uh, software um, and, and hardware with IGBTs to be able to trigger quench protection very quickly when we start seeing those coils go normal because these magnets, when they start going normal, it, they will get destroyed if we don't have an, action, an active quench protection circuit. So we have quite a bit of controls um, technology and quite a bit of um, also power electronics that are used in uh, this type of system. Uh, let, me, let me skip that one. So, one of the things that we're now doing as part of the magnet development program is we want to be measuring the magnetization of some HTS coils. So what we're doing right now is making some very, very thin coils that will go into that gap. So here it shows it going into the structure where we'll be able to test the, um, the magnetization and measure it and compare it with some of the smaller sample results that are actually being done um, by Mike Sumpton's team that I know that Karuba um, works with quite a bit. So this is going to be an important measurement for MDP. We've already done a large coil the other, in the other direction for measuring the magnetization, and this will help us measure the other direction. And then, um, as I mentioned, we also had worked on these high field uh, solenoids for SMES. So these were um, tape wound coils. <clears throat> I'll just, let me see if I show you a picture of one of them here. So they look like this. This is for another project that we had, but they're, so what they do is they take the, the, the YBCO tape and wind it um, into a coil, and then we stack them on top of each other to be able to get to, uh, let me go back now. Sorry for all the builds here. Too many builds. Okay. So they're stacked together here, um, and then there's a mechanical structure put around the coils to hold them all in place. And then this magnet, was, uh, was tested, um, again, we used the fast energy uh, quench um, extraction. And this, this, at the time that this was done back in uh, 2011, this was actually a world record um, in HTS uh, solenoids of 12.5 Tesla at 27 Kelvin. And this was a project that we worked on, uh, RPE funded again with, uh, with uh, Superpower and, um, and uh, the Brookhaven National Labs working in tandem. So another project that we've been working on with um, the uh, Institute for Basic uh, Science in Korea is actually using the same technique to develop a high field uh, magnet for um, the axion search. So this, we've actually used this, this, this is a little bit different, this coil here, in that the coil before was insulated. These are what we call non-insulated coils. So the idea is in HTS, HTS conductors heat up very, very quickly unlike low temperature superconductors. So it can be very, very difficult to detect quench in them when they're happening because the voltage doesn't rise very fast. And so one of the, 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 the techniques that people have thought about to protect these type of uh, magnets is actually to wind them with no insulation. So the consequence of that is it takes me a very, very long time to ramp up that magnet. So it won't work for AC applications, but something like um, uh, NMR magnets, um, this might be fine for because they're small, smaller magnets 
but they can go to, to very high fields in their DC applications. So this may not be such a good thing for accelerator magnets, but it may work very well for DC applications. And so this is a path that a lot of uh, places like Brookhaven, the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, the guys in Korea, this is a, an area, and even the fusion guys are looking at this as an area to explore um, to keep their conductors stable and not burning out when they have quench. So it does take, as I said, a long time to ramp up. So for the, these, uh, these coils, it'll take up to one day for that to ramp up that whole solenoid. So it is a very slow process. But this is a very hot topic right now in the uh, HDS space for DC applications. So we did do some um, different studies on this. And it's very interesting. The quench dynamics of these is an area that people are really, really studying to see how, um, how it, it behaves. And, What's, um, what's interesting is we can see that it protects the coil very well because what will happen is even having a very, very large quench, it, it goes to normal very quickly. And um, you know we did a very detailed study to see how this worked and how it propagated amongst the different coils. So we can see here's the, the coil where we heated it up to, to induce the quench. And then the other coil followed very quickly because there was good conduction um, between these, these two coils um, in, this, in this situation. And there's a very fast propagation because of the inductance between these two large coils. So the, 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 it seems to be very scalable so that you can build very large magnets out of this um, and have them behave um, in, a, in a nice manner. Hello, there it goes. So we're also looking at this type of technology for other science <laughs> magnets. And this is an example of a small SBIR that we were working with um, a company, Particle Beam uh, Lasers, who does a lot of work for accelerator magnets. This is made up of a lot of retired guys from the accelerator community. And so we're looking at, we, this is a, a, a sort of a demonstration coil. Eventually, we'd like to be able to do a 25 Tesla solenoid for a potential neutron source application. Um, and you need this, this interesting conical coil shape because of um, the space needed for um, the, neutron, the neutron beam going in between the magnets. You don't want it hitting um, and damaging the, uh, the coils. Oops. <clears throat> And then another thing that we're really looking at, um, we have, we're really looking at how we break down barriers and really between the different silos and DOE. Um, and being a multi-disciplinary uh, lab like Brookhaven is, there's, there's quite, a bit quite a bit that we can do in this space. So we're looking at our test facility and how we can take our test facility forward to help um, both the high energy physics community, the, the fusion science energy community, and the um, nuclear physics community. So we have in addition to those five test facilities that I was talking about, we actually have a very large hole in the ground where we can test even bigger magnets than the magnets that we have today. And so what we would like to do in the future, right now we're, we're, not, we're not waiting for this to happen. I mean, we're already using our, our 10 Tesla magnet that we have to start testing both, um, as I showed you, those conductors for the uh, magnet development program. We're also working with the, uh, the folks at uh, Commonwealth Fusion. Um, with Infuse to test, to start testing cables in this structure. But what we would like to do ultimately is in this big hole that you see here, is we'd like to be able to test larger magnets. So we can think about large magnets that we may need for the EIC. This is an example of, um, of a very large iron, uh, cold iron magnet that would need such a test facility. Um, in addition, we could think about just having a, a magnet that we develop as a larger test facility to put bigger cables in, to put bigger um, test coils in for HEP. And this could be a home for all of these things. And we're working on upgrading, upgrading our infrastructure, both the power supplies, the cryogenics, and then continuing to update, you know, continue to have leading edge uh, measurement capabilities at Brookhaven, um, you know, working in partnership with Lawrence Berkeley and Fermilab on all of those, those best things to put in this, uh, this type of facility. Um, and there's quite a bit of industry interest that we've gotten in these capabilities. So um, we're working in partnership with GE on technologies for offshore wind. Um, we're also you know, exploring things with the United Technology Research Center on aircraft, CFS on uh, compact fusion. And then you know, we have a bunch of partnerships with small businesses. And also even some venture capital folks have called us up to say, hey, can you help us out in looking at the HTS space? So one thing I'd like to say is that we really are interested in partnering and helping people be successful. That's part of the role of the National Labs. We aren't here to compete. We're here to help 
universities and industry succeed. So if you guys are looking at startups, if you're looking at you know, working on your grants, we're there as a facility to work with you. So please feel free to you know, reach out and uh, we'll see what we can do together to help you guys. And um, you know, we have, as I said, quite a bit of these, these partnerships. We work globally, like with the IBS and the Large Hadron Collider. Um, we're looking at a lot of different um, applications, as I mentioned, um, in the superconductivity space. One of the other ones that's kind of interesting is we have a, par a very small partnership right now with Best Medical to actually uh, measure this uh, magnet that was built by Everson Tesla and help them with understanding field quality issues with it. Um, we're also looking at what type of accelerator designs and accelerator magnet designs they might need for uh, carbon therapy uh, going forward because they're in the proton therapy space. Carbon therapy is an emerging area for cancer treatment. And so there's some interesting things that we're looking at there as well. Um, and so part of my role in coming from industry to Brookhaven is really to help expand partnerships, develop partnerships, help the whole magnet ecosystem and um, really look at these pieces becoming a larger percentage of the portfolio so that we aren't quite just focused on accelerator magnets but also on other areas. So, um, you know, I just wanted to say I'm really excited to be at Brookhaven and making a difference. I'm excited to be here today talking to you guys and, um, you know, really interested in uh, all types of partnerships with the magnet industry and anything we can do to help you guys out at the university and get your stuff out there. That's what we're here to do. We're kind of a bridge. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to let everybody know, too, that we have positions open in my group, and also there'll be positions open across Brookhaven. So I'll just sort of end with that, and I will make sure that your professors have the, uh, the job uh, connections so that you guys can know if, you, if you're looking for a position. We're, we'd be very happy to have you at Brookhaven. And if you're not ready yet, you can come do an internship. You know, we're very happy to, to do that as well. So anyway, with that, um, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Maybe I'll start with one. Uh, so you mentioned how the early accelerator, mag accelerator magnet helped launch uh, nanium titanium. Yes. So do you see a similar trend with um, the higher speed conductor like nanium titanium? Like, do you see the cost coming down with the maturing time? So niobium 310 is a hard one, but I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about why that whole wind and react thing just makes it very challenging because of all of the, the particulate you get just developing from having something that I have to stick together and then bake it in an oven and then I get carbon in there and then I have to VPI it. And so dealing with all the challenges of vacuum impregnation with that, there are a lot of manufacturing challenges that need to be addressed. Now, people are thinking about that in the accelerator community. So they're saying we could have projects to look at this. So that, that is one way forward. And I think you know, that, that is still a possibility because niobium 310 is not a super expensive conductor into itself. It's really the process that's the challenge. So can you do the engineering right to make these things lower cost? So that I think the jury's still out on. But I think there's a lot of opportunity for R&D in that space to look at solving those problems. And then, no, 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 you don't have to pause it. But I'm just saying that, that that's an area you would need to do research in. And I know that Arno Dervaux last week was just talking about this when I, we were at Fermilab, saying that, that, that if we're going to do um, niobium 310 magnets for FCC, these problems absolutely have to be solved. So that could be something that, if FCC happens, could help solve it for niobium 310. Now, the other thing I see that's really interesting, and this is going to be a grand experiment that we see get carried out over the next 10 years, is I, I did my, my PhD thesis on high temperature superconductors. I then came to GE and tried to work with them. And it was an awful experience. I don't know if Karuba probably can tell you about that, too. But it was not easy you know, 10 years ago when we were working on this stuff. Um, and we, you know, we even had people from GE say, you couldn't pay me to take the material, which made a lot of people really angry when you go talk to them about it. And, and I kind of felt this way for a long time. But what they're doing right now with these compact fusion companies is really going to see, can we get the cost of YBCO down low enough that with the quantity production, that it may then spread to many applications that need a lower cost conductor. So it's going to be a grand experiment. We'll see how it works out. The jury's still out on it. But I think it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Because they're ordering the whole world supply of YBCO right now between two companies over the next five years. So they're going to have to expand their capacity. And then we'll see 
can the companies really deliver on what they said in terms of increasing the capacity and the cost coming down? So that's another thing that I think we have to keep an eye on. I don't know which way it's going to go and who's going to win, but we'll see where it goes. Yes. Sure. Conductors that we associate having superconducting properties at room temperatures are not materials that we associate as conductors at room temperatures. That's right. So what are the characteristics that research scientists are usually looking at for materials or kind of space <clears throat> that they look at to try and identify potential materials that could be superconductors? So and again, I'm not an expert in this space, but there are, you know, certain things that they look at with the, especially with, I know in the high temperature superconducting space, they look at different, different uh, behaviors of, you know, the, the type of material structure and what could they expect to see if they do different things. The other things they'll do is they'll sometimes compress materials to look at them under pressure and see what kind of phase changes that, that exist in those materials. But it really is, you know, and they're, and they're, it really is a guessing game. They do a lot of guessing of what are the types of materials that we can see. You know, like perscovites were a big area to look at when, you know, they first found the, the first discovered uh, um, the superconductivity. And then that's how the YBCO came around because they were checking out all these different perscovites when they found it in that space. And so a lot of it is just understanding the physics of different types of materials and then, and then guessing from that point on and, and seeing. It's, that's why it's, it's such a huge challenge to look at these things. Yes? You talked about the challenges of the physicists and the engineers trying to work together. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm curious because uh, you know, I see some of those processes and, and I think you know, what, what can we learn from other wound uh, field kinds of structures that circuits have been making forever? Um, and even you know laying up some of these uh, some of these more advanced conductors with with film film ceramic processing that's been developed for thermal uh, applications for a long long time is, is there enough cross flow in these fields or is there still lots of opportunity for, for bringing things together I think there's still lots of opportunity for bringing things together and I think you know being at an amazing university like you guys are there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration between all of these different multidisciplinary groups to, to look at these kind of problems. Um, and I think that where, where I see in the accelerator field, I mean, I was very fortunate at GE, I felt like we didn't have a class of, well, those are physicists and those are engineers over here. Um, you know, I worked with, you know, brilliant theoretical physicist, Jim Bray, who also had a huge respect for the machines guys, you know, and it was a very good environment there at the research center. And I think Bell Labs had that too, from what I understand of just scientists and engineers coming together and working beautifully. I, and I see pockets of it in the accelerator community, but I think that they have a ways to go. And I'm just continuing to fight that and say, you know what, I'm a physicist, but these engineers, this is where the hard problems get solved with these, these coils. And you need to stop treating them like they're just a bunch of magnet guys working in a corner. You know, it's like they, without the magnets, you can't do the physics. So, so I, I think it, to me, it's a cultural thing too to say, you, you know, you can't have this this world of where the particle physicists are the highest level. It's like everybody from the particle physicist down to the guy sweeping the floor is important, in my opinion, and it all needs to come together to make it work. So um, that's a, a cultural thing that I think still needs some work in, in this community. But I think certainly at a university, you guys have a very collaborative culture where it'll be good, like, like what I experienced in industry. So, yes? So the training process, again, um, <laughs> it's, it's, there's some science, but there's not enough science. It's still a bit of an art. So some of the, the whole thing is the idea with training is in these, these magnets that are seeing very, very high forces like accelerator magnets, and I have an epoxy resin in there that's filled with glass, there's going to be cracking, there'll be delaminating that'll happen along the conductors because these are really taking it to the limits of the, the epoxy structures. And typically where that happens, when you think about it, if I'm compressing this thing in along these things that are very long, that may be holding that brilliantly in, in this direction. But when I get to those end turns, the forces are totally not protected in certain parts of that. So we'll, you'll actually see cracks and delaminations along the end of these coils. So that is what is happening when you see this thing quenching, 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 because we're getting to the limits 
of the epoxy resins and and struct and support structures that we have today. And and so I think that that's going to be a really important consideration in terms of the mechanics as we go to these really really high field magnets. I think it's going to have to be done very differently than how they're doing it now because we're seeing the limitations already with the niobium 310 magnets. So when the quench happens, you basically pull the current, you dump the current out of the magnet and then cool it back down again and then do do the same process, ramp it back up again and then it'll do this, you know, do the next one and then it'll you'll cool it down again and do the next one. And it, so it's a it's a process to allow these cracks and delaminations and everything to happen or the conductor even to move sometimes in, in place till it gets to a more stable point. And what you hope is that you haven't damaged the magnet too much that when I warm it up and cool it back down again, that it'll still go back to that same same curve. So you don't want to have a magnet that what we call retraining, which is when I warm it up and cool it back down again, then I have to go through that whole sequence all over again, because that's very expensive for the, the amount of energy I have to put in to reliquify the helium. So yeah. Yes. Oh, do you? Oh, are we done? OK. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.